Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. The Electoral Affairs Commission has received 25 applications for legal status to run for the 14 directly elected seats at stake in the upcoming legislative election. With the vote less than three months away, this year's race is poised to take place against the background of an ever-growing fragmented electoral battleground in both the pro-establishment and the opposition camps. To look into what's in store for the election and also into Macau's own political culture and development, we are joined by Hao Zhidong, a professor of sociology at the University of Macau. Professor Hao Zhidong, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. <laughs> As we speak, nearly 18 years into the establishment of the Makai SAR, and now that we are just a couple of months away from uh, the vote from the legislative election, um, what do you make of the state of the art of Macau's uh, idiosyncratic, I would say, political culture? Hmm. Actually, Macau's political culture has always been um, like this. Actually, when I first came to Macau in 2003, I remember reading some of the research done in the past about uh, Macau's political culture done by Yu Zhen and people like that. And one of the characteristics was uh, uh, political uh, uh, apathetic or, um, you know, attitude, political apathy. Um, is that still the case? I think people are more, I would say, more um, excited, more, uh, more likely to participate in the political process, especially young people. I mean, after the 525 incident or demonstration, uh, which was Back in, in 2014, uh, the right, large-scale right. protest against the... Right. And if you look at the tickets, uh, at least from the last time, you can see a lot, a lot more young people. So I think, mm, it, I think it's fair to say that more people are politically active. Um, but compared with itself, that's probably the case. But compared with Hong Kong, and with Taiwan, and I think there is still a lot lacking in terms of enthusiasm, in terms of people's, you know, looking into the future, what do they want Macau to be like? And, uh, that's not clear. And why is that? Has it got to do with Macau's own social fabric, with, uh, uh, you know, history, with uh, other factors? Definitely. Uh, definitely has to do with Macau's history. Um, even during the Portuguese Macau time, the Portuguese were more or less acquiescent or um, um, obeying the uh, order of the day, especially the pressure from men in China. It doesn't matter whether it's the Ming Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty or later on, you know, later governments. Um, partly because of the smallness of the place and also the limited resources that the place has. So it really has to kind of, not kowtow would be a big word, but uh, I would say uh, um, more compliant with what the mainland Chinese government wanted. So that, that's, I think, a, a, a geographical political limit, limitation. Um, in terms of its own culture, I mean, the political culture of the, the Chinese people and the Macanese people um, and the Portuguese in the past, you, you probably could say that they were more active in the past, maybe because that was a colony and the Chinese people were against the colony, colonial government. Therefore, they were more active. But once the government is returned to China, um, Chinese control, uh, they feel that, well, this is our own government, therefore we should support it rather than rebel against it. So that, I think, may be one way of thinking. Although, of course, it's problematic because to rebel doesn't mean that you're against the government. You're just uh, dissent. To dissent is to try to make it better. So it doesn't mean that you're... Uh, you have ill will towards your government, not necessarily so. So it's a political culture issue, uh, both geographical, political uh, limitations and its own social development issues. Uh, 
So geography, history, of course, these are key factors. Uh, so in this respect, would you agree with those who say there's a sort of path dependence uh, dynamics in what is and what may be and what was Macau's political development and Macau's political culture? Um, path dependent on what? Um, I don't know, uh, because the path didn't seem to me to be very passive. I look at one, two, three incident, you know. So uh, the, the Chinese were very active against the colonial government. But once it comes to their own rule, the Chinese rule, I think the things are different. Um, so I don't know what path. Mm. In the, I mean, in the sense was. there's a, a great, let's say for instance, um, what some consider the patriotic camp, which has been uh, shaped uh, throughout the second uh, half of the 20th century, and more so after the one, two, three incident and the Cultural Revolution. Okay, so in terms of patriotic path. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, that is true, I would say. Th th that is true. Um, but it doesn't mean that they have to remain the same. Uh, because if you have a lively society, if you have an active society, you should be a society with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of uh, opinions, and they should clash with one another, then in that discussion debate, uh, something better mm -hmm. rise up. So that would be a more healthy or healthier society. But if you have one dominant ideology, uh, others are being other opinions is being stifled or, 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 or not really, people are not really saying much about their life, their future, uh, especially political future. I think they do say a lot about social economic issues. Um, but again, why can't those issues be solved? Like the light rail problem, um, we have so many problems. Uh, and also the um, uh, ferry terminal problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, so many problems. And people know all those problems. Now they're talking about the, the bridge, the Macau, Hong Kong, Zhuhai Bridge. Um, people know the problems, but they know that they, that they can't solve them. So if they can't solve them, then they need to find out why we can't solve those problems. Um, if it's a political issue, let, let's deal with the political issue rather than acquiescent or just follow whatever path, which is patriotic path. If that's the path, I think it's a problematic path because it doesn't really excite people to do things, to do the right thing. Um, that I think is problematic, if that's what it means by path dependence. Uh, uh, a while ago I was mentioning uh, the fact that the political landscape has become more fragmented. And that is mirrored both, if you look at uh, election tickets, at least uh, what we are expecting uh, in the so-called pro-establishment, but even in the opposition camp. Uh, what's your comment on, on, on this fragmentation? Um, I think it's normal. Um, normal in the sense that if people have different opinions, that's fine. People should have different opinions. So if they are fragmented, that's okay, you know. But that may be one stage of the political development. Because, for example, take the democratic camp, for example. If they want to really win in an election, uh, persuade people, to convince people that they are uh, the right direction, you know, theirs is the right direction, um, but they, then they have to really mobilize. They have to have a strategy as to how do you convince people that you, your path is the right path? And you have to do something. And uh, of course, the more the people you have, the more people who support you, the better. And uh, the more united, if your camp is, the better. Um, then they have to find a way to do that. So if they don't find a way to pursue a goal, doesn't matter what goal that is, right? Um, if they believe it's the right goal, then they, of course, should pursue it. 
But if they don't have a strategy, if, if their force is fragmented, um, for a while it's okay because that fragmentation may actually um, help them to uh, find a better way to do things. But if they keep fragmented, then they're not going to reach their goals. If they're not going to reach their goals, what's the purpose of organization? So they need to suddenly think about those things and see what they uh, should do. So fragmentation, fragmentation, I think, on one hand is good because in any case, people are thinking. At least people are thinking, you know, so that's good. But they need to think out a way to do things. So if they can't figure out a way to do things, they keep fragmented. It doesn't matter what movement, movement that is, it's not going to succeed. It's, it's, uh, so what you're saying is that counterproductive. We, if a fragmentation leads to infighting right. uh, and to a deeper rift, or let's say, for instance, uh, divide the sort of generation gap, right. not only a generation, but also some uh, values other than the pursuit of uh, universal suffrage. Right, exactly. Uh, Just like the Hong Kong, ish, Hong Kong uh, uh, movement, you know, the uh, uh, Occupy movement is fragmented, you know, no one seemed to listen to anyone else, so it failed. Now, so the failure was not for the good of the movement not for the good of the central government. I mean, no one won in that, in that situation. So what's the purpose, you know? We can see, and perhaps it's a bit early to jump into some conclusions, but I would say that that was already, to some extent, the case four years ago. My point is that we can see that the push for universal suffrage and political development is not so much an issue on top of the agenda, even if you look at the platforms of the uh, so-called pro-democracy camp and the pro-democracy candidates. So why is that? They more focus on livelihood issues, of course. Probably people are mostly concerned about it, or is there anything uh, going on? Um, I think it's all right. It's good for people to focus on livelihood issues. But the problem is that whether that focus will get you anywhere if the political status or political system is like this. Now, we have already seen the problems of light rail, problems of ferry terminal, problems of public housing, and all kinds of things uh, we have already seen. Um, have we gotten anywhere yet? I, I'm not sure we've gotten anywhere. So that, I think, partly is political. So if they don't focus on political, they're not going to solve those problems. So the, but, but why don't they focus on the political? Uh, I think one of the uh, reasons may be people's disappointment. They have been disappointed because Hong Kong's strife for democracy didn't really go anywhere. Um, I would say probably that's not only because of the central government, but also the strategies of the Hong Kong movement. They didn't seem to have a strategy, you know. So they failed, so they are disappointed. And just like mainland China, a lot of people are advocating for democracy, but they feel that there is not much they could do. So they, a lot of them just give up. Um, in Macau too, I think, Hong Kong didn't succeed. Well, I think Macau people would say, if Hong Kong succeeded, we might have a future. If Hong Kong didn't succeed, where are we going to go? Um, what I said before is that uh, the central government could have given Macau a policy that they gave Hong Kong, because Macau, for Macau, that would be a big progress if we have, for example, two to three candidates to, for people to vote. That would be great. You know, why couldn't the uh, uh, central government give Macau that policy, right? So, but they didn't. So people in Macau, I would say, from my observation, seems to be just like people in Hong Kong, people in mainland China, are disappointed about the political development, and they don't know, they don't see a future. So, so is that a, a sense of hopelessness uh, yeah, to yeah. some extent? I, I, I think about. so, I think so. Um, but couldn't that lead to some sort of nihilism? Especially among the youths. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And also political apathy, um, nihilism, uh, historical nihilism, whatever, you know. So, uh, but, 
But people being people, I mean human beings, human beings are thinking animals, so they think. It's, it's not that if they don't see the right thing being done, they're just going to give up. Some may give up, but there are still other people who don't. So I think uh, uh, eventually, I, by the way, I'm an optimistic person, so um, eventually I would say people will think and people will uh, work towards a goal that they will believe to be the right direction, you know. So uh, eventually, hopefully, that's only temporary. <laughs> so uh, while in Macau, let's say, for instance, if we look at the Legislative Assembly, uh, uh, we had a round of political reform uh, just before the last legislative election, um, whereby we had a, an additional two directly elected seats and two indirectly elected seats. Uh, looking ahead, I mean, of course, we, we ain't got any crystal ball here, but would it be expected uh, or expectable um, this kind of incremental approach, step by step, and let's say, for instance, to extend a bit more, a couple of more seats, um, I mean, uh, directly elected seats, uh, at the expense of nominated or appointed uh, lawmakers, or even implying a, a, an extension and enlargement of the composition of the LegCo? Yeah, actually, um, people have been talking about political reform uh, in conferences, symposiums. The 2 plus 2 plus 100 actually didn't change anything. So it didn't change the basic structure of the legislature. And I was wondering whether that's because the um, SAR government didn't want to do it. And I was even wondering whether it was the Chinese central government wanted Macau to go a step forward, but Macau didn't want to go. Uh, so that's my guess, because the reason is that when Sui Sian um, did his uh, annual report, right, uh, suddenly there was this mention of political reform. No one, I remember reporters asked me what I expected from the uh, annual report. I said, mm, nothing much, you know, I, I didn't expect about the political reform. Then he, he did it. So I was wondering, huh, is it because the central government wanted him to do it? So he did it, but he did it in such a way there was not really not much change. Um, people were was expecting, for example, uh, decreasing the number of appointed, indirectly oh. elected and appointed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there was some progress. For example, um, uh, it says that the indirectly elected part should be competitive. You know, you, sh you should have more candidates than that hasn't been the, the, the case positions, yet. but that, that has not been the case. I, I, I guess this time they're going to have, what's it, the labor move, uh, labor, labor, what do you call it, field. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they are going That's to have functional two. Functional constituency. Yeah, 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 two uh, uh, candidates uh, rather than one, so there's going to be some kind of competition. Um, but again, there is a lot people can do about that in terms of competition. So even, that's okay, I mean, if you want to have uh, indirectly elected uh, uh, legislators, that's fine. But make it competitive, you know, not competitive, not only in one, um, is what, uh, the f functional uh, group, but all the fun uh, functional groups, right? Um, but not only all, all the functional groups, but also, all the organizations in that functional group. So bring you know, a, so to, to stir uh, or at least uh, to spark, expand. Uh, expand also in the conversation and debate. Right? Exactly, Ex expand the base, expand the voting base, and expand the conversation. It's, it's doable, but they don't seem to be doing it. <laughs> like in Hong Kong, most seats are uh, faced, and I'm talking about for functional constituencies, a competition. So there is some, some even some pro-democracy candidates managed to secure seats right, uh, right, a, right, in the right, functional constituency right, right. Uh, sector, right? Right. So there is a lot of work they can do there to expand democracy. Um, even at that time, I was talking about Hong Kong, um, 
for example, if you just follow the uh, August 31st decision by the Standing Committee of the People's Congress, you could still ask the uh, functional constituencies to be democratically elected. You know, uh, even you could ask uh, the members of the election committee of the uh, chief executive uh, to be elected. You know, those members would include uh, the members to the People's Congress, <laughs> members to the Political Consultative Congress. If you ask those, member, those, those members to be elected, that's a lot of progress. But they didn't do it. So it's, it's a pity. Um, so here in Macau, if you could uh, um, kind of expand the voting base, expand the competition, that would be a lot of progress too. What about this issue of uh, you know, the municipal bodies or non-political municipal bodies? Uh, this has been mentioned more than once by the chief executive in his policy address. Um, it, hasn't come, it hasn't come into fruition. Um, would that be at a different level a way at least to uh, promote some uh, uh, sort of reform, administrative reform, and at the same time allow members of these bodies to be directly elected? Are you talking about the vice the, 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 the municipal bodies, or to, to, have, uh, uh, to have again a municipal body which would have to be non-political because of the, of the basic law, uh, something with some resemblance to what you have um, in Hong Kong with regards to the district councils. Oh, I see, okay. Hmm. Would that be a, a, a suitable way to, at a different level, to promote some sort of uh, participation? Sure, level, sure, sure. Level? Sure, I would agree with that. Um, then you have a municipal council of Taipa or <laughs> Macau, maybe different districts, I, I guess. Um, yeah, that would actually be a way to get more people involved, you know, uh, get more democratic participation. Uh, the, my only question is whether it's necessary in terms of solving problems. Um, but certainly something is better than nothing. <laughs> so so my, my, my hunch is that probably would help. Uh, let's now just for a couple of minutes, shift our attention to Hong Kong because there is some sort of uh, interwitement between sure. with both SARs. Sure. And even when it comes to political reform, you're saying, well, if Hong Kong had uh, succeeded in adopting uh, uh, an electoral reform package, even if that was, that, uh, that was put forward by the central government, then Macau would eventually probably follow, yeah. follow suit. Um, now that we have Carrie Lam at helm uh, of the uh, Hong Kong government. Would we expect a new round of political reform, uh, an improved package or something else uh, that might come out of the coming uh, term uh, of uh, Carrie Lam? I always say it all depends on the government, you know. Um, both governments, both the central and Hong Kong government. Um, when uh, Sui Sian said that when people asked him about political reform here in Macau, he, his answer was, um, uh, that's not our decision. It's the central government's decision. Uh, but actually, that's not what's said in the basic law. <laughs> the basic law says that if you want political reform, um, you have your legislature um, agree upon that idea then get, get it proved by the chief executive, then put the idea to the central government and let the central government, People's Congress, to uh, consider. Um, that's what is said in the basic law. So it's not, of course, whatever you put up um, has to be agreed with by, or agreed to by, by the central government. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the central government which initiates the move. It is the local government that, <laughs> that should initiate the move. So if, but of course they have to have some consensus as to what, what removal we, we, we want to take, you know, what uh, steps we want to take. Um, so if the local government wants to do something, they can certainly 
consult with the central government about it um, to see whether it's doable. Uh, and I think some small steps certainly are doable. Like what I said, expanding the, the voting base, um, it, 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 it expanding the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, democratic processes. Certainly, it's doable. So if they're really seriously thinking about stability, about winning people, they they really should do something. You know, small steps would help. But then, wouldn't that boil down to the following question: Are the political and business elites of the SARs, and particularly this SAR, the Macau SAR, truly interested in that, or that would be some sort of half-hearted approach to it? Um, whether they're interested in democracy is a question of whether they have any concern about political legitimacy, right? So if they think they have no need to win people, then of course they don't have to think about it. But if they think there's a need, if they have a sense of crisis, um, a lack of confidence, um, which I think they, they should have. I mean, look at uh, the problems we have now. Uh, the light rail problem, as I said just now, the ferry, ferry terminal problem. Oh, 120 booths of uh, 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 checking points for uh, uh, incoming uh, travelers. Why do you need that many uh, uh, tables? You know, so that's kind of weird. But but anyway, it, it does happen. I mean, uh, all of these projects have increased budgets, sometimes double. Why is that? Something got to be wrong. But there's no social unrest. And and and, and then, for instance, we had the National People's Congress uh, head. Jung the Jung, and the message was, well, well, aside from great. everything's great, aside from some small, smaller issues, uh, there must be improvement, but the, the general idea and uh, the underlying message was, you're doing well, and this is the good student of the one country, two systems formula. So where's the need if, if you have a, a high-ranking official in town saying this? Um, I think uh, there, there are two discourses. One is the um, official discourse, right? The official discourse always sees the positive side of things. But there is also an unofficial discourse, which is mostly on social media, uh, when people are seeing more problems. Um, I would think that the central government also sees the problem. Um, they also have to think about legitimacy problems. Um, it's not true that they don't think. Um, if they're really thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to think about this issue. So in that sense, um, they might have to think about political reform um, sooner or later, right? Sooner or later, uh, big or small. And of course, small steps would be better because it is small. No one wants chaos. People want peace, people want stability, people want development. So uh, small steps would help, and pe people would, have, would be happy with, with small steps. When you talk about legitimacy, of course, political reform and, and democratic reform would be a, a way out or a strategy. But there are other strategies would not, which would not necessarily entail that. Right. So, e economic performance, for example. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, um, social welfare, uh, livelihood matters, uh, social stability. Um, sure, sure, sure. Um, economic transparency uh, uh, from the official. Right, economic development would be another indicator of uh, le le legitimacy. Um, but other than that, there's more. Because as I said just now, people are thinking animals. You know, they they're not they're not pigs. Like you know, if you have if you feed them, they'll, they'll be happy. No, no, that's not true. I mean, if you feed them, they may not be happy. They, they still have something they want. Um, dignity, for example, respect, um, participation in politics, because they're thinking animals, they, they are political animals too. So if they're political animals, they want to participate. They want to say, you know, in the way things are done in the city or in the country. Um, so if they're not, if they don't get that, 
I don't think they're going to be happy. Um, they may be happy for some time, but once they have everything, then they're going to think about some th something else, and they're not going to be happy. So to, to get social um, satisfaction, um, I think that's also uh, another indicator of political legitimacy. If they don't have it, uh, they're not going to think it's all, all the regime is legitimate, uh, even if politi I mean, economically are doing well. No, that's not enough. Uh, one last question, uh, Professor Hao Zhidong. You're about to leave uh, your post as a full-time professor uh, at the University of Macau's Department of Sociology. Uh, you first came to Macau, you've been based in Macau, I shall say, uh, since 2003, just before the boom. Yeah. Um, you've witnessed transformations. Uh, my question has more to do with social and political transformations, uh, the political culture, uh, the civil society level, a grassroots level. We've been studying all these matters. Um, in a nutshell, if possible, what would you have to tell us about the transformations that you've witnessed as a, as a Macau citizen, as a sociologist? Um, one of the attractions of Macau uh, and China actually is that it is a fertile field of social research. Um, social like research- a test tube, as a sort of laboratory, right? Exactly, in the sense that it's a developing uh, area and it has all the issues of development, which are issues of social study. Um, the past, the current, and the future, you know, so it's a kind of exciting um, study field. Um, that's one of the reasons that got me here. Uh, but what, when I was, for the, uh, it was just for the changes, right, social changes, political changes, um, not that much um, from what I've seen, uh, from what I've seen. Um, if there's any change, I think it's kind of changed backward. Um, for example, uh, politically, I think uh, mm, people are less open than before. Um, I used to be able to write in Macau Daily, for example, and publish articles in Macau Daily. The, the largest Chinese language uh, paper. Right, right. Omu right. Nyapo. Right, right. Omu right. Nyapo. Um, and also there was uh, Chiu Ding, there is a, a magazine which I was also helping to uh, establish uh, in terms of being one of its writers, our main writers. Um, but later on, I think the journal turned less concerned about men in China. Um, so I think there is, a, there is an atmosphere, and also in terms of the University of Macau, um, is academic freedom shrinking? Yeah, I think the academic freedom is shrinking in the sense uh, with some indicators like uh, uh, the firing of, uh, of a non-continuing uh, non contract with uh, Bill Chow. Uh, that, that is one indication. But there are other indicators uh, or indications of uh, um, uh, less encouragement in um, politically controversial debates or, or discussions on campus. Um, one of the most recent indicator, uh, indication is the uh, requirement of the faculty members to report uh, whether they have met any uh, people from Taiwan, if they go to visit Taiwan, who are they going to meet, what, uh, what are they going to do, then we have to report all of that if it's on the official or, or research business then the question is why, you know. And also we know that somebody from uh, uh, Taiwan, a scholar, was green, leaning green, you know, uh, a scholar. Independence leaning, leaning camp, right? Right, 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 right. But he was barred from uh, entering Macau. Now he was already in Macau, uh, the airport, and he, he, he had to take another flight back <laughs> directly. Um, what's the point? You know, this just doesn't make any sense. Um, besides that scholar, the, the project they did was a uh, Hong Kong project, Hong Kong government supported project that was done by some Macau scholars along with Taiwan scholars and Hong Kong scholars. 
So what's the point? <laughs> you know. So those things uh, certainly give people an idea. Or plus, for example, if you want to mention Taiwan, you, you cannot say a Republic of China, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they have all of those restrictions. So that it makes the atmosphere seems to be uh, more politically conformist uh, rather than a lively debate of issues, socially important, politically important issues as a, a place to produce ideas. You know, that's what university should be like, right? But that doesn't seem to be the case now. And um, uh, that, I think, is backwardness. Um, so that's not good. Uh, so politically, I think there's some backwardness. Socially, I think people are more active. As I said just now, more young people are engaged. So that's good. Um, but they are also uh, disappointed uh, with all the failures of political reform around the place. Doesn't matter whether it's Hong Kong, and China, or Macau. Um, people don't see much uh, of a future in, in terms of political democracy. So that, I think, is backward. Of course, it's, it has to do with the general atmosphere of the general um, um, uh, China, you know. So I, I think that's my feeling. And, but I hope that's only temporary. I hope that uh, uh, those things eventually, I mean, people eventually will open up. People eventually will get more engaged. The university will eventually be really like a university. So, hopefully. And with this, we wrap up our talk. Professor Hao Zhidong, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Such a fascinating talk. Pleasure to have great, you on the show. Great, Pleasure to be here too. Okay, thanks. And to you at home, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week.